I'm Callie Crossley, and this is a special Facebook Live here at the WGBH Boston Public Library Studio. We're in partnership with the American Inspiration Author Series by American Ancestors. So, by way of background to this discussion, for many years during February's Black History Month, McDonald's sponsored a touching ad campaign called 365 Black. If you're like me, you probably thought it was just a generous corporate effort to celebrate Black History Month, and it was. But it also represented something I didn't know about, a decades-long relationship between McDonald's black French franchisee owners and the corporation itself. The history and its meaning, that history and its meaning has now been documented in a new book called Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. The author is Georgetown University history professor Marsha Chaplin, who joins me here at the Boston Public Library. Welcome. Thank you. Now, just a bit of background about Professor Chatlin. She is, this is her second book. Her first book was Southside Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration. She's also written for TheAtlantic.com, Time.com, and Ms. Magazine, and the Chronicle for Higher Education, of higher education, that, that I should say. Welcome again. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, $570 billion industry, that's fast food, of which McDonald's is a significant presence. And we should say that your book covers a lot of uh, fast food corporations, but a focus on McDonald's. So let's go way back <laughs> and um, first tell people how uh, McDonald's came to be uh, kind of the place to go, because it didn't start off with having any connection with black America. No, it didn't. So when McDonald's became the franchise that we know today, Ray Kroc, their leader, really focused on suburbia. He felt like this was the place McDonald's was gonna grow up. Places that were around bedroom communities, new strip malls, places in which people had access to cars. But after Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968, the economic landscape started to change. And McDonald's, out of concern over disagreements with white franchise owners who no longer wanted to do businesses, um, in neighborhoods that were demographically shifting from white to black opened up the opportunity for African-American franchisees to come in. And in many ways, the language of housing is also appropriate for fast food. People talked about the white flight of businesses and it gave African-Americans the opportunity to franchise and soon McDonald's realized that they had hit gold mm -hmm. with this captive market of people who were new to fast food in an environment in which business options were declining. Um, you, there's a term used in your book I, I hadn't heard before called disaster capitalism. So things blew up. Um, literally, there were some riots in the street and you know racial strife. Um, and that, as you just described, opened that door a little wider because of those uh, former franchise, franchise owners who were not really interested in being in that neighborhood afterwards or felt they wouldn't be safe. Absolutely. And so disaster capitalism is this idea that when there are huge disturbances in people's lives, sometimes they're caused by nature like Hurricane Katrina, sometimes they're caused by racial unrest like after King's assassination, marketplace actors start to seize on it. And in many ways, I think for African Americans, the introduction of these businesses is often a reaction to some type of social racially based unrest. And McDonald's was able to capitalize on the post-1968 climate because the civil rights movement was also shifting its focus towards business development and the Nixon White House was supporting black capitalism through subsidies for African American franchise owners. Okay, so um, I want to go back to what brought this all together for you. That's not intuitive. I certainly wouldn't have thought about, wow, there's something connected outside of just my burger and my french fries and the fact that I see them often in black neighborhoods, um, you know, bigger than I knew. Uh, now I wanna talk about what brought this to your attention originally. So a few things, growing up in Chicago, knowing the presence of African American franchise owners in a number of places, not just McDonald's restaurants. And so I talk about in the book the first time that I ever read a book about Chicago's Great Migration, which would be the subject of my first book, was because I was in a Black History Month quiz show bowl and the black McDonald's operators sponsored it. The first time that I really saw something on TV about Martin Luther King after the adoption of the MLK holiday was sponsored by African-American franchise owners. And so as I 
proceeded into my career as a historian, I always thought to myself, how strange <laughs> it was that black franchise owners opened me up to black history. So I was curious about that relationship, but I was also interested in a conversation that was heating up in the early 2000s about health and racial disparities. And people had a lot of things to say about African American food choices and food deserts and all of these issues, but I always felt it was strange that no one talked about the history. Mm. Why were there so many fast food restaurants in African American communities? And I think that why is such an important factor in thinking about food activism and food justice. Okay, we're just getting started with Professor Chatlin. Um, you're going to want to ask some questions, and we're on Twitter and Facebook for you to do so. I just wanted to remind you. Her book is called Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. We are here in partnership with the American Inspiration Author Series by American Ancestors. All right, so disaster capitalism happened. It looked like doors were opening, but it wasn't that simple, actually. No, it's never that simple. And so in the ways that franchise owners talk about the opportunity relative to economic white flight, they also talk about inheriting restaurants that were damaged in uprisings that were very expensive to operate and secure, battling some issues of violence and gang activity near their restaurants. And so in many ways, these early generation of African-American franchise owners were able to be successful in a system that because of their race still limited their ability. I talk about how African-American franchise owners actually charge McDonald's with redlining. Mm. And they argue that they can only get restaurants in inner city communities. And so in many ways, you see the limits of capitalism in delivering real equality for communities. But I don't want to just harp on that part. I also want to talk about why it's so complicated, because for many of the communities that got these black-owned McDonald's, the McDonald's was the entry point for a lot of important community programs. But again, they're always limited because they're being delivered by a private corporation. So I want you to tell some of those early stories, but first let me explain for people who are thinking redlining. That's a policy that was instituted by banks. Um, it's supposed to be over, but you know we can argue asterisk. that. <laughs> we put a little asterisk by it. Um, where banks literally, with a red line, drew circles around communities for which they would not offer mortgages. So here they are. Here are these um, franchise owners are trying yes. to be, and they can only get a mar mortgage within certain confines. Absolutely, and also the reason why franchising became such an opportunity for African Americans in the late '60s and early '70s is that they were able to tap in not only into government programs, but their enterprise was secured by the size of McDonald's because it was so hard for them to go to traditional banks to get loans for small businesses. And so when people wonder why fast food and not grocery stores. Mm. During this time, fast food restaurants were considered small businesses. For the purposes of the Small Business Administration, grocery stores were not. So you start to see these structural ways where the inner city is only able to attract a certain type of business, and that type of business becomes an important food source for people in those communities. Well, to your point, this is a complicated story because it's about um, disinvestment and investment Absolutely. at the same time. And by that, there was also at the time uh, uh, an assumption or a, a belief, a hope, maybe all, of, all three, that if you invested or certain people were able to invest in bigger capital than certainly the average uh, black American could at that point, then that would trickle down to other folks, that they would have these uh, facilities, they could expand, they could hire more people, some of that would eventually come on down and bring up all the boats. Yeah, so we see how well trickle down has worked well, over yeah. the past 40 years. And I think that's the cautionary tale in this book. You know, it, this is not an unimportant day with the New Hampshire primaries and the Democratic candidates are talking about their plans around inequality. And anytime someone talks about business development as a response to poverty or racism, school, um, you know, inadequate funding for schools, housing discrimination, you know, my spidey sense goes up because I think that this is a really clear example about how these development schemes don't help people in the ways that I think even the most, um, you know, optimistic person thought they would. 
And I think that that is the great lament of fast food in black America, that there were good intentions, but the structure never allowed for those good intentions to ever materialize because it's not built for that. All right, I'm pushing back because somebody's hearing you saying, but they hired people that would, they were going to be abandoned, mm -hmm. perhaps, at, in the wake of, of uh, certainly right after uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, assassination and what happened there. So they hired people. Um, these people would not have had jobs. They probably wouldn't have had jobs even at, at low wages now that we may mm -hmm. look down upon, but they were regular jobs. <laughs> right, and <laughs> what I would argue back is that if we think about you know, what King was advocating in the last year of his life, we actually have a system that can help people, and it's called our taxes, it's called the public good, <laughs> and whether it's universal basic income or a serious fight against poverty, we don't know what we're capable of because I think that there's been such a default pivot to the private sector to solve problems that I think are in the interest of the public good. All right, so I mentioned that um, it was hard getting in. Let's, let's tell some stories about some of those, those early folks. Um, Mr. Petty, for example, uh, one of the first franchise yeah. owners in, in McDonald's. So Herman Petty is from Chicago, my hometown, and he was the first African-American to franchise a McDonald's restaurant. His store opened December 21st, 1968, and it's no coincidence that that was essentially eight months after King's assassination. He was recruited by a guy who's very important to this community named Roland Parrish, who I interviewed and he said he didn't go to restaurants growing up. He grew up in the segregated um, South in Tennessee, and he didn't even know what McDonald's was until he went to get a job. Both of these men had spent time in the military and for many of the early generation of entrepreneurs, they found their opportunities through military service and they found the limits because of race after their service time. Mm. And so they were able to work their way up through the McDonald's structure. Um, another person who I interviewed for this, um, Wayne, uh, I'm losing his name right now. <laughs> um, he was a former um, professional basketball player. And so he came into franchising Wayne Embry mm -hmm. um, with a little bit more wealth and having had a college education. And when I interviewed him about his relationship to McDonald's, he told me about being one of the few black players on his basketball team in college and having to sit in the bus by himself mm. or being refused service when he would try to eat with his team. And so there's this deep poignancy um, for all of these men, not just because they were able to be successful in a time that was really hard for African Americans, but it was around restaurants, which was a place of such antagonism, such fear, such intimidation for African Americans in the Jim Crow era. And uh, going forward, um, the story that, that kind of fascinated me was what happened in the Cleveland area, um, where there was actually a burger boycott. Yes, there be, was. Um, because this was a big fight with McDonald's. Explain what was at stake and, and, and what happened there. So traditionally, when we think about civil rights and restaurants and public accommodations, we think of people boycotting for the right to enter and be served. But Cleveland was a little bit different because African Americans in Cleveland were huge supporters of McDonald's. They spent a lot of money there. And there was a boycott because they wanted the right to franchise it. They wanted to own something in the community that they could use for reinvestment. And at the very time, there's this massive boycott of McDonald's in Cleveland. Carl Stokes is running for his second term as the first African American mayor of that city and of any major city in the United States. And it really illustrates that there was this political economy of McDonald's that African American politicians had to weigh in on, African American community members were really pushing McDonald's and saying, well, what kind of citizen are you going to be in our community? What can we expect from you? And I think that conflict really helps push back against this notion that all black people just love fast food <laughs> and it's this easy relationship because mm -hmm. while cities like Chicago embrace the opportunity, cities like Portland and Cleveland and Philadelphia really pushed back on fast food for many reasons. But in Cleveland, it was really about how authentically black you could participate in the marketplace. What does it mean to buy black? And can communities have control over that process? So what's interesting now is that um, it, some people just flat out say McDonald's um, 
is black now. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, you know, in, in 2020, that's how most people think about it. Now, certainly I travel around, I see McDonald's in many McDonald's places. everywhere. But how is it that that is, a, that is an overarching, pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> um, feeling about McDonald's? <laughs> people often ask me, they say, well, everyone goes to McDonald's. How do you say McDonald's is black? And what I argue is, is that McDonald's means different things in different communities. And for black America, McDonald's has been the entryway to more than just food. It's been about a series of cultural experiences and social experiences and economic experiences that has essentially racialized it. And as a result of that engagement, African Americans out perform in terms of buying McDonald's. And so when a McDonald's has more meaning in your community other than a place to get burger and fries, this for me is incredibly curious and I think allows us an opportunity to take some pause about how we set up our most vulnerable people mm -hmm. to have these relationships with businesses. I am here with Professor Marsha uh, Chetlin. She is a history professor at Georgetown University and the author of Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. And we are here in conversation and in partnership with American Inspiration Author Series by American Ancestors. And we got some questions from the audience. Oh, you can send you, in folks. your questions on Twitter and on Facebook. What role do you think fast food franchises play in our cities today? Well, this is a fascinating um, question in light of some recent reporting that was done by Business Insider in which African-American franchise owners are leaving in large numbers because of some of the concerns about the inequality within the system. They're arguing that they are absorbing higher um, mm -hmm. operation costs so that McDonald's is no longer the kind of economic opportunity that it once was for them. They are still claiming some levels of redlining and with McDonald's modernization, the different attempts that McDonald's has made to be more like a coffee house, to have Wi-Fi, to have all of this automation, they are also losing out because they have to absorb those costs. So I think that the franchises are still present and the African-American franchise owners are still present, but they're losing ground in this system. And I think it's because the fast casual category has given McDonald's run from its money. I think there's more fast food chains that are competing with it. But what I see in cities like Ferguson, Missouri, mm -hmm. and in parts of the south side of Chicago, that presence of the black franchise owner is still incredibly powerful because that's the guy who goes on the radio to remind you to vote. That's the person who is arranging health screenings um, for various um, conditions on Sundays. You know, it's the woman who's presenting the scholarship check. And so I don't think that their influence is dwindling, but. I think it'll be interesting to see how McDonald's turns the corner with the new CEO and its African-American um, campaign. It launched one of its first campaign in about 15 years mm -hmm. called um, Black and Positively Golden. Mm -hmm. And so you see these efforts again to try to get that market share back. Um, because it had produced so much for it in the past. So a couple of things. You begin your book talking about um, that McDonald's in Ferguson, Missouri, and people may know that's the place where Michael Brown was shot uh, by a police officer. It started a, a, a series of, of protests and demonstrations and um, really is a, a seminal moment in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. So talk. you just spoke a little bit about his presence in the community there in Ferguson, but you saw something about Ferguson in addition to your own experience early on at McDonald's that pulled this all together for you, the history. Yeah, I, I thought that Ferguson was like a bookend to 1968 in which you see the kind of anger and frustration over structural racism and alienation come to a head. And in 68, that's what brought McDonald's to the inner city. And in 2014, it was like the McDonald's was sustaining the community in light of other absences. And so that McDonald's on Florescent Avenue is incredible because it was the place where police officers were changing shifts. You know, guardsmen were coming in to cool off. Journalists were filing stories and uploading it on the internet. And protesters were going seeking milk from being um, hit with tear gas. It's all happening in the same place that's able to remain open because of its resources in the community. And that's actually a black franchise, McDonald's, by a man named Jimmy Williams, whose father was the first black mayor of East St. Um, East St. Louis, Illinois. And so in many ways, I think that McDonald's represents the political economy, the racial tensions, and in many ways, the disaster capitalism. Because after 
the uprising in Ferguson, folks like Howard Schultz from Starbucks said, we're going to bring a Starbucks in, we're going to bring in jobs. But I don't think people realize it's not that Ferguson had a lack of retailers mm -hmm. or a lack of fast food or lack of restaurants. Mm -hmm. It was a lack of political power for the people who needed it the most. And so I think that McDonald's watching it on television almost every night as the kind of center of the community, I think spoke volumes for why I wrote this book. Also, just fun fact, on the same street, um, there's a real famous soul food restaurant, which was featured on Oprah, uh, not, uh, on, on Oprah's um, uh, network. network yeah. Yes, yes, for many years. So it's just kind of interesting. Um, and I want to point out that there is an organization that was formed by the black franchise owners. And when you talk about their coming together to talk about it, there. It was formed a long time ago and mm -hmm. for them to be able to talk to each other about these issues. Yeah, the National Black McDonald's Operators Association formally um, was created in 1972 and it was this loose association of men who were operating McDonald's restaurants under the stress of the disrepair in the stores, not having access to the same type of training opportunities, and who also understood that they had to um, walk a fine line. Mm. And one of them described um, the Operators Association as his SNCC, his NAACP, <laughs> his L SCLC, like all of the civil rights organizations because they had to speak for themselves in a system that understood that they were successful but did not fully respect them. Okay, here's another question. Do you know what percentage of Chicago's fast food franchises today are owned by people of color? Um, I think it's a very small number. Mm -hmm. I would speculate that it's probably in the single digits. Mm. If you think about franchising across the board of fast food outlets, the numbers are still very small. Recently, Business Insider um, said that the numbers were hovering at 300 in the early 2000s, and I think they're in the like 210s now. Mm. Um, but the thing I want to point out also about fast food franchising, we often think about the franchise industry as the drive-through, mm. but franchises are everywhere. And it's interesting to think about the ways that people of color have been very much encouraged in the fast food sector, but not so much in hotels, mm. and not so much in the other types of services that are franchised. And I, and I uh, just want to let everybody know that while the focus is on McDonald's, that's the, in the title of the book, you really do a, gr a great amount of work talking about other attempts to franchise mm -hmm. um, um, with other restaurants, um, all kinds, some that have gone away that I forgot about, and some that still exist, and, and what that experience was like for um, folks of color. All right, another audience question. Fast food places are trying to adjust to changing demands of customers. Does the healthy food movement affect black-owned franchises? It does, but it's interesting about healthy food. Um, when the movie Super Size Me came out, McDonald's felt a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to add different options. That's when you started getting apples and Happy Meals. And the salad. And the salad. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> who's going to McDonald's for a salad, right? Mm -hmm. um, two things about that. One, I have a lot of questions as to whether African Americans are ordering those foods. Mm. Um, that those foods, I think, are available, but I don't know in terms of how much they're being ordered by this kind of main consumer base. But I also think that the healthy food inclusion disrupts a lot of how fast food makes its money mm. because it's food that can now go bad very fast. Um, the margins are much lower on a salad than on a, a large soda. And I think the inclusion of these foods has created um, an impact on the franchise owners because now they have to order so many different types of food. The reason why the McDonald's brothers were so smart is that they closed their restaurant and they took a bunch of food off the menu. Mm -hmm. And they simplified it because they realized that if you make three or four things on your menu, you can make it quickly and you can make a lot of money. With fast food now including so many different types of foods, the margins get a little bit more complicated because you're ordering so much more food. And so I think for the, again, the black franchise owners, anytime there are these changes or introduction of new food items or introduction of specials like value meals, a few people told me that the value meals were really challenging mm. because now they're discounting 
the product oh, right. and it is harder and harder to make money when you have those discounts. And the thing about fast foods from the, from the customer viewpoint I know is if I drive in there or walk in there and it's not the same as it was, I don't care if I went there six months ago, I'm mad and you know, that's the whole point of it. It has to be consistent. Absolutely. So that's another pressure to make sure that Incredible. everything is, comes out and it's the same as I can expect it was. Now here's a, a part of the story that is also interesting, which of course makes sense. Um, the fact as, as McDonald's was becoming black or whatever, however you want to put it, um, they cultivated um, advertising that was targeted to African Americans. Now these days people would say, well yeah, duh, but <laughs> that just wasn't done back in the day. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, the idea of market segmentation and marketing to African Americans has a long history and really had a moment in the Great Migration. But it was in the late 60s and early 70s that McDonald's perfected the form because they hired um, uh, an advertising company called uh, Burrell Communications. And Tom Burrell is the you know, grandfather of ethnic marketing. And he understood that you couldn't just replace white people with black people in ads. You had to use certain types of language and certain types of styling and aesthetic choices to create this kind of image. And some of these ads do not age well, I will <laughs> warn you. You can Google them and go on um, YouTube and look at them. But one of the things I argue in the book is that from our vantage point in 2020, these are deeply offensive. Mm -hmm. But I will always say that for someone in 1974 who had only had federal protections to be in a restaurant for about a decade, mm -hmm. who did not experience dining as a result of Jim Crow segregation, these ads were really effective because they said McDonald's is a place you could be yourself, you don't have to worry, and we're there for you. These things mean something, and I think it's very e easy for us to dismiss advertising and think that we're smarter than the content, mm -hmm. but the advertisers are pretty clever, and they understand these complex relationships that African Americans had to public places. And then, when McDonald's really got good at it with the commercials, they started to bring in black celebrities, mm -hmm. um, black musical forms, I spent the day looking at advertising old TV ads of McDonald's, and I felt like my entire childhood was unfolding in front of me, right? <laughs> it's almost 40 years of nostalgia mm. in terms of, oh, I remember that ad. I remember how cool I thought this was. Mm. And they really helped open not only doors for advertisers, but I often think about all the black creatives who were employed mm. as a result of these efforts. I have to also say um, that they perfected the poignancy factor. Oh, so Because good. I have cried on many a McDonald's <laughs> commercial. I mean, they just knew right how to, how to get you with that. Um, there were little stories. Yes. And not everybody was doing that even back in the day. No, and, <laughs> and, and when McDonald's, McDonald's is the focus of my book, not only because it, for me, is personally interesting, because they set the standard on how you do this. Mm. So when they started their minority franchising initiative, Burger King and KFC and all of these companies saw what they did. When they did the ethnic marketing, all of the big companies said, this is how you do it. And Burrell Communications was working with Coca-Cola and American Airlines. They have always helped set the framework for how businesses are going to compete. And so I think in many ways we can say, yeah, everyone does it, but everyone didn't do it initially, and it was McDonald's that set the stage. So I want to pick up something that you've said several times, but just to be clear about it, that the fast food industry benefited from federal subsidies. subsidies. Um, just talk about that a little bit more about how that may um, open up some doors in, in many different directions, even though in the end it might not have uh, been as fruitful as some might have thought. So the idea of encouraging black business development comes from a moment in the late 1960s where people are unsure about the next step. And what was so fascinating about promoting black capitalism as a federal government project is that it appeased people across a wide ideological spectrum. People who were conservative and did not want integration knew that it worked because it was predicated on people staying segregated. And liberals were interested in the idea of business and community development because they heard so many people say that they were frustrated with the lack of opportunity in their community. And so at this kind of nexus, you have business development. And Richard Nixon knew he was not gonna win overwhelming support from African Americans, but what he was able to do was to get key people like um, football player Jim Brown, soul singer James Brown, um, members of the civil rights establishment to support 
these black capitalism initiatives. And so Small Business Administration, Office of Minority Business Enterprise, they were able to create the funds that a lot of people tapped into to create franchises because again, they were considered small businesses. And then there's a very iconic person named Brady Keyes who says he, he received up to $9 million wow. in federal funding to start his own chicken franchise and then one is in KFC and Burger King. So you start to see this really strange way that the federal government underwrites mm -hmm. an industry that they will then later, decades later, point to and say, well, you're hurting people's health. Mm -hmm. And so from my perspective, you can't have it both ways, but you start to see how these decisions in the 60s and 70s create an environment where the incentives are to go into fast food franchising. Okay. The book is Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. It's written by a Georgetown history professor, Marsha Chatlin. And I wanted to ask, um, what surprised you? You did serious research. <laughs> um, I always like to, re to tell people that that does not mean it's boring. It is not. It is very, very interesting. The narratives are, the, the storytelling is just fabulous. Um, but what, what surprised you, because you went through tons to tell us these stories, and um, what do you think about when it, what's, when it stands out in your mind? <laughs> the thing that surprised me the most, and I think I'm still so curious about, is when I was doing research about the 1960s, and the fact that McDonald's was the target of so much uh, desegregation activism, mm. and the fact that that's not remembered as part of the story. So when young people learn about the sit-in movement and the end of Jim Crow and public accommodations, they often point to Woolworths, Katz's Drugs, and Rexall. Three companies you don't see anymore. Rexall, there's a few left. Mm. But McDonald's was actually the target mm. of desegregation protests in Memphis, mm. in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, all throughout North Carolina. After those four young men sat in at the Woolworths in Greensboro, their colleagues, other college students in North Carolina schools started to protest McDonald's in Durham, North Carolina. I find it fascinating the way that McDonald's is not in that story. Mm. And I always I speculate that their alignment with African Americans and they, their presentation of the opportunity in black franchising as part of their contribution to the civil rights movement kind of erased them from that story. Mm -hmm. And I was just really, really fascinated about all of the work that people did at Southern McDonald's to desegregate it. So in, in Google parlance, that would mean they pushed down all those stories. Yes, so you'd have to I go don't to know like how they did it. <laughs> to find out. But the archives <laughs> tell us a different story. <laughs> yes, that's because you went to page 13 and page uh, 24. Um, what do you want people to take away from your book um, if there is a message about black capitalism, or is that too much to put on this book? I mean, Danger Will Robinson, right? Like the old <laughs> show used to say. Yeah. I think that there is nothing wrong with eating a hamburger. I think hamburgers are delicious. I <laughs> Do think you think McDonald's hamburgers are delicious? Oh, McDonald's <laughs> has some, the, I think they have the best fries, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, everyone's gonna at me now, but <laughs> I, I think they have the best fries. Mm -hmm. I think the experience of going to McDonald's as a kid was fantastic. I don't want McDonald's to ever be in a position where they are setting the way that people live or they're being used to respond to the ways that people live. That business is not designed to solve social problems. And as we enter another election year, it seems like we have one every second, <laughs> um, we really need to push back um, against policymakers, against people running for elective office who say business development is what's going to really lift people up. I think people lift people up, and I think our public good and our common resources can do those things better and with more compassion than any business can. Okay. You've been on book tour for a while. What's the common response to people who've read the book and who come back to you um, surprised by many things? But I'm, I'm cur curious about what sticks out for them. I <laughs> love on being on tour and people telling me their McDonald's stories <laughs> because this, is, this book is incredibly critical, but it's also about memory and also about relationships that we have. And I had a woman, an Af um, African-American woman in Kansas City say to me, when I was a kid, my grandmother learned how to make ice cream because she didn't want us to be at a colored window buying ice cream. Mm. And she said, I remember the first time I went to McDonald's and had a milkshake. She remembers that. And people remember the black franchise owners who gave them their first job, their first dates at McDonald's. And those are the types of memories that I think are important because when we 
understand our relationship to institutions that we think we know but we don't know, I think we're more open to taking a critical eye by recognizing their importance and then questioning why they were so important in the first place. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Surprising history well told. Thank you so much. Uh, my guest has been Georgetown University history professor Marsha Chatlin. She joined me here at the Boston Public Library with WGBH, in WGBH's studio in partnership with the American Inspiration Author Series by American Ancestors. Now, the book can be found online and in stores now, but she will be signing books right here at the library in just a few minutes. Let me remind you um, that Professor Chatlin also wrote the book Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, articles for the Atlantic.com, Time.com, and Ms. Magazine, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Hey, she also is one of 32 really well-known oh. folks um, uh, named uh, uh, to a Carnegie Fellowship. That is quite something. Congratulations. Thank you. And she's using that fellowship to write her next book, um, which is going to be called The Scholarship Kid, A Social History of Higher Education and Inequality in America. Good luck to you. Thank you. It was great. Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs>